Tucker Carlson has made his endorsement and probably not much to your surprise. It's Donald Trump. Let's take a listen. I certainly support Trump. I'll tell you that. And I can tell you, I mean, I've always agreed with Trump's policies, always. And I lost friends over it. Um, but, and I've never really actively supported anybody because it's not my job to actively support people. Right. I watch, you know, right. I like to watch. Um, <laughs> but I'm a voyeur. Yeah. <laughs> but I became an active Trump supporter when they raided Mar-a-Lago last summer, the summer of 2022. That, that, that's just, that can't stand. No, that can't. And that I was something. agree with Trump on a lot. But even if I disagreed with Trump on a lot, I'd still be a Trump supporter because you cannot allow that. You cannot allow the... You know, the regime, the president of the United States to use the Justice Department to knock the front runner out of the race. You can't do that. No, you can't do that. So it's bigger than Trump. It's bigger than Biden. It's a question of, you know, do you want to live in a free country with a functioning justice system? You know, that's exactly. And right. so I'm voting for Trump. And if they convict him, I will send him the max donations and I will lead protests. That's how I feel. That's how I feel. Because too. and by the way, if I thought that he had committed some real crime, I wouldn't feel that way. But he didn't. He and Biden are both found with classified documents at home, along with every other former high-level federal official in history, but only Trump is indicted? Like, tell me how that works. Oh, shut up. So there you have it. I, not a surprise to me, Jessica, probably not to you either. But I think what he's getting at in terms of this raid at Mar-a-Lago is this idea that a lot of people have about Trump, which is that sometimes the attacks on him seem so unfair or so politicized that it makes people want to support him more. Kind of reminds me of a lot of rea the reaction from a lot of conservatives during the Kavanaugh hearings where they felt that this man was being unfairly attacked, unfairly maligned without proper evidence to support the sexual assault accusation and that it was a basically a political show trial meant to try to keep him off of the Supreme Court. A lot of people that I know in the conservative movement kind of describe that as sort of a radicalizing moment from them. And I think Tucker is sort of alluding to the same kind of idea here with the raid at Mar-a-Lago. I think it is a surprise for me, actually, Amber, because uh, Tucker Carlson's text messages, he spoke about not being able to wait till they weren't covering Trump every night. And didn't he say, I hate him passionately in a text message? So for me, I'm kind of squaring, can that also be true? And he be Tucker Carlson's favorite candidate. Can you actually hate the candidate that you endorse and will donate the maximum amount of money to? That's what I'm trying to square in my mind. Does Tucker Carlson genuinely hate Donald Trump and also want him to be president? I think he was kind of expressing this sort of I guess popular sentiment among media professionals that it can be frustrating when the entire news cycle is repeatedly about Trump and people get really tired of that. And that was a sort of common sentiment, I think, ahead of the 2020 election, too, is that a lot of people really had Trump fatigue. It's one of the reasons why we saw suburban uh, voters move away from Trump ahead of that election and go for Joe Biden, because Joe sort of presented himself as this return to normalcy candidate, that things were going to be quieter and less crazy. And so I definitely don't think that it's mutually exclusive, that you can find yourself annoyed with Trump or frustrated with Trump. And knowing Tucker's textile for him to say he passionately hates him is not a surprise to me either, but also support the man's policies and think that the attacks on him are perhaps evidence that he could be another effective, uh, effective leader again for a second term. Yeah, I don't know if someone that I enjoyed the policies of or liked as a candidate, like like Bernie Sanders was on the news every night and I always had to talk about him and cover him. And I was annoyed with talking about him all of the time. I don't know if I would say I hate him passionately, but this was, of course, January 4th, 2021. It was when there was a lot of discussion of election fraud in the GOP. And now we have some new reporting. I think if the GOP is so concerned with election fraud, they should maybe look in the mirror in Arizona. Cochise County Supervisors Peggy Judd and Terry Crosby were indicted by a state grand jury on charges of interfering with an election officer and conspiracy. The pair of Republicans allegedly conspired to delay a vote to formally accept their communities or their county's votes during a time period required by state law, the indictment could have major consequences for 2024 uh, in this election cycle where we have a presidential race. As the Washington Post reports, the indictments 
uh, mark a rare example of possible criminal consequences in the battleground of Arizona. County officials, state lawmakers, and GOP candidates have continued to try to delegitimize election outcomes and procedures, and public officials are deeply concerned about any potential efforts to delay or derail the outcome of the 2024 presidential election. So I wonder, you know, if Trump changes his tune and goes back to some of the rhetoric on the 4th of January in 2021, would Tucker Carlson change his mind then? Was he really sick of reporting on Donald Trump? Does he hate the election fraud stuff? I'm not sure what this means for the GOP going into 2024. I can't imagine it radicalizing some of them. Yeah, I think you just have to know how Tucker talks to understand the passionately hate comment. Um, It's sort of a type of throwaway line he would say about a lot of people and maybe either change his mind or not really mean it and kind of be exaggerating. But um, this Arizona case is interesting. I mean, obviously, if these people actually committed fraud, they should face the full consequences. I wish that we crack down on voter fraud more aggressively than we do. As noted in this report, it's pretty rare that people will face criminal consequences for any type of fraud. Um, This one seems pretty severe if they tried to actually Um, delay the results of the midterm elections. And I think what I've always said and what a lot of Republicans have always said is that if you're going to go after election results or try to challenge the results or ask for a recount, it needs to be done through the proper legal channels. You need to file the appropriate lawsuits. You need to ask for the appropriate audits, the appropriate recounts. And trying to do it in a way that is unlawful is obviously not acceptable and not the proper way to do that. Um, That being said, I will say, I mean, it does obviously challenge the idea that voter fraud doesn't exist, even if it wasn't necessarily on the side that conservatives or Republicans have been claiming that it always is. Um, I also take issue with the idea in the the reading that, um, that it's, I think it said Republicans have been trying to derail election outcomes or challenge election outcomes. I mean, we know previously that Hillary Clinton still to this day says that she lost the 2016 election because of Russian collusion or Russian disinformation, despite the fact that there's no evidence that anything to do with Russia changed any votes in the election, and that the amount of interference, as she puts it, on Facebook was relatively minimal compared to the overarching amount of political ads and content that were on Facebook at the time. You have Stacey Abrams, who for a long time refused to concede the Georgia gubernatorial election, despite having no evidence that fraud occurred there. So I don't think that this is a partisan issue by any means. Right. Yeah. You have people, you know, spreading conspiracy theories. That's what I would call it. What Hillary Clinton has done about election interference, right? Spreading misinformation, manipulating voters' opinions before they get to the polls. But then I think there's this whole other side of the electoral process in the United States where you have lines that are four hours long in Miami-Dade County, where you have a surplus of uh, polling locations in cities where there's majority white populations and really a deficit in cities where there's majority black populations, that access to just being able to cast the ballot is a a hugely important thing for an election cycle. So because we live in the kind of legal environment where we can't prosecute crimes before they happen, it's not the obligation of our police as the Supreme Court has ruled to have a suspicion of a crime being committed in the future and try and prevent it. They don't have a, a duty. Uh, to prosecute crimes of that nature. And so if they were to do this in advance of the election, if they saw, you know, some fringe online chat rooms trying to collude around, you know, minimizing votes, attacking certain polling locations, what have you, uh, instead what we're going to need to do is improve our process of obtaining ballots, of voting, of allowing people to register to vote, of ensuring that there is integrity of elections, meaning that everyone who wants to cast a ballot actually gets to cast one. This should be the main concern of anyone that's genuinely worried about election fraud or election interference. We need to be on, you know, the best defense is a good offense. Let's improve our process of having elections. It seems that there's not many people talking about this. Um, And I, I think it's what everyone should be talking about, Hillary Clinton included. She has no business still talking about Russia in 2016. Absolutely. All right. We're gonna have to leave it there. More rising after this.